perceived wisdom of the Irish is we're very artistic and that we're musicians and our poets and so on. Um, and I guess maybe it's because we haven't sold ourselves in the way we would have liked either, because there's no doubt through the 1800s, you know, and the first part of this century, there were some fantastic Irish scientists. So I guess maybe we haven't blown our own trumpet loudly enough, would be one way to put it. It's also easier, I think, for people, say in the media or in other well, like walks of life like that, to push the arts because they understand it themselves. The trouble with science is it's very specialised and the terminology puts people off and so therefore the people who write the opinion pieces in Time magazine about the Irish, maybe they aren't able to discuss science or in the way that we'd like them to. So that might be a cultural thing I guess as well. Science has never been part of the stereotypical image of the Irish. But while the popular view of Ireland is that of a creative nation, today, scientific research and innovation are thriving in Ireland. Of course, creativity and imagination are central to any scientific discovery. And these aspects of the Irish mind have nourished Irish scientific endeavor throughout its oft forgotten history. And while that history is illustrious in many respects, the path of Irish science has not always run smoothly. You know, Ireland has a long and rich heritage of science. Irish scientists in the 19th century were, were on the world stage. They were brilliant. They were known everywhere. And yet when the new state came into existence in 1923, science didn't prosper, really, from 1923 in many ways up until the end of the 1990s. I mean, there are those who would have a suspicion, those that would argue that the newly independent state didn't feel comfortable with science. Science was, after all, the domain of the Anglo-Irish of the 19th century. There's something not Irish about it. And the state actually, moved away from, from that culture systematically and felt uncomfortable with it, really, throughout the, the whole existence of the state. I remember when I was in school, the more arts-oriented friends of mine would say you couldn't possibly consider being a scientist. So generally it was seen negatively, I'd say, by, by many, many people. And it's a fantastic adventure that humans are on, really, scientifically. So I just get an innate pleasure out of it. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is this, this dreaded curiosity. I, I want, I've got this yearning to understand more about the area I work in. And, and you can't beat the thrill of it when, when you do make a discovery. And it's a bit like, uh, I call it the, the Christopher Columbus moment, when, when the, kind of the, the cloud clears and you see the new world. The new world which Luke O'Neill would explore was the inner workings of the immune system at a deep molecular level, where he'd make the breakthrough discovery of a new human protein called Mao. O'Neill is working with another research team in Oxford University, led by a leading Irish geneticist, Adrian Hill. Their work together will almost certainly lead to a vaccine for malaria and contribute to considerable advances in combating many other serious diseases. What I really wanted to do was uh, not go to America, not go to sort of developed countries and see exciting hospitals, but to go to Africa, and that's exactly what I did. And when I got there to Zimbabwe, there, there was a civil war on. There was immense suffering from disease, and that just struck me as a theater in which far more people should be doing something. And I think that has impacted on my interests in, in research. What I'd like to see most of all by the end of my career is a malaria vaccine deployed, being used to control malaria in those populations of sub-Saharan Africa. And that, of course, of course is, a, is a huge ask. There are major research groups around the world trying to tackle this. The science is incredibly complex. You need huge amounts of money to even get a single vaccine. It will take time just because of the nature of the process. If we had a fantastic idea tomorrow that we knew would be a malaria vaccine that would work for everyone, be easy to manufacture, be very cheap to distribute, that would take five or ten years to get deployed. But even with immensely complex problems like an HIV vaccine, you can see that progress is being made. 
The ultimate thrill would be if my discoveries or any of the community's discoveries gave rise to a new treatment for malaria or TB or arthritis or MS. I mean, that would be the absolute jackpot because then you'd really feel that you've made a difference. Now, we're always trying to slag off authority, or at least we always feel slightly rebellious, you know. And the Irish still have that, I think. And that kind of rebelliousness and that capacity to, uh, to, to sort of rub up against the dogma, I suppose is what you'd call it. So if, if you're trying to rub up against the dogma and trying to criticise the dogma and trying to, you know, puncture someone's balloon, as it were, you might be driven to trying something a bit more radical that might be then a bit more adventurous and a bit more risky, I suppose. And then, lo and behold, that might turn out to be the thing then that allows the field to move forward. So I think there's an element of that. And certainly Irish scientists at conferences and so on, they're often the ones to ask the, uh, the, the tough question in a jocose kind of way, though, not, not, in, an, not in an aggressive, accusatory way. You know, and certainly uh, that, that part of our, our, our history might, might be informing that attitude, I guess. One of Ireland's foremost scientists, Gareth Fitzgerald, is a leading world authority in pharmacology, now based at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. All the way through the, the sort of mechanistic side of things, uh, uh, the uncertainty, the uh, unsolved problems, uh, uh, which actually as you went through medicine became more and more evident to you. You start off thinking there's an answer for everything and then uh, medical education is like a serial process for you realize there are almost answers for almost nothing. Uh, um, that sort of appealed to me increasingly. After spending time studying and working in Europe, Fitzgerald moved to Vanderbilt University in Nashville during the 1980s, where he became a key player in a groundbreaking finding. The discovery that a low dosage of aspirin could substantially help in the prevention of coronary disease would help change the lives of many. It is a team sport science, and um, it, it is a naive scientist who claims that they've had a eureka moment and uh, have delivered uh, um, a major breakthrough all on their own. Uh, I think we played a very integral part in the realization of low-dose aspirin as a, uh, an important cardioprotective therapy. Uh, but I wouldn't for a moment suggest that we were the only people that played a role there. There were many interlocking parts to this story. I think what, what is an interesting um, element of this story, however, uh, at a time when there is increasing emphasis in this country, in Ireland and in other places on uh, the re-emergence of academia into the process of drug discovery and development that the whole aspirin story was almost entirely developed in academic settings. Back in Philadelphia, a research team led by Gareth Fitzgerald was asking some hard questions about new drugs for arthritis about to enter the mass market. Their investigation into Vioxx and Celebrex would pose serious problems for some of America's pharmaceutical giants. Eventually, Vioxx was withdrawn from the market after tests proved the people taking the drug were more likely to suffer from heart attack or stroke. Congressional and judicial hearings followed, as well as numerous landmark legal actions. That introduced me to a different type of relationship with, uh, with drug companies. The thing that I felt and feel is that the obligation on somebody like me is to tell the truth as I see it. Now, having said that, when the truth as you see it is on the front page of the Financial Times, it makes you very nervous. But on the other hand, I felt that there was a real obligation to say what I felt was true. And there's no question about the fact that the majority of new drugs and vaccines that have emerged to alleviate the uh, human suffering in the last 20 or 30 years have come overwhelmingly uh, uh, from the pharma and biotech industries. So, so um, you know, I, I think getting that relationship right 
uh, is a bit like uh, a marital relationship. It keeps changing. You've got to keep working at it, but it's worth it to make it work right. Intrinsic to good science is questioning authority. Uh, um, you know, dogma uh, is there to be challenged by experimental fact. Now, you've got to do that in a way that isn't just rebelliousness for its own sake, uh, um, that is communicated in a way that is um, personality independent, really. Uh, just the facts, ma'am. That's what you want to focus on. Here in London, at the Royal Free Hospital, Irish surgeon Peter Butler is to the forefront of pioneering work in plastic surgery and facial reconstruction. His innovative and cutting-edge approach gives hope to the most hopeless. Usually, when we're asked to see somebody from another, by another colleague, is that they've reached the end of the road in what they can potentially offer. and they have no solutions in regards to trying to restore normal anatomy, and we have to come up with quite inventive solutions. Hence the progress towards things like facial transplantation and tissue engineering, which is generation of growing tissues, which is another area of research of mine. Uh, I was interested in art, um, and uh, I found art uh, quite uh, enriching, but also found medicine interesting, and so plastic surgery as is the career I followed, merges those two uh, disciplines quite well. Interesting, it comes back to the educational process. I mean, I think that's one thing Ireland, I think, does well, is it had a very broad curriculum, like the baccalaureate. Interesting, when I went to Harvard, I came from Ireland feeling that I wouldn't be able to, well, I might have a difficulty competing against Harvard, since it's the number one medical school in the United States, so you have the best graduates and then found that I actually competed very easily with them. And that actually is something you didn't learn in Ireland. I and mean, sometimes part of evolution is actually to go out and then suddenly see yourself from a different perspective and then, and then you know where exactly things are. And that's one thing I found in Ireland. I mean, I would go to people with research ideas. And in economic times of restraint, it's very difficult to fund everything that comes through your door. So, Asha, why do you want to do that? Would be a reasonable response because you've got limited resources. The American experience was, why wouldn't you want to do something like that? And so it was a more can-do type of approach. Though I see that has changed, um, certainly when I came back to Ireland. And this may be an evolutionary process, or maybe it's people returning that have brought this thought process with them. But it's only positive. Back in Ireland, other highly qualified and visionary scientists returned to Irish universities to find a country still less than fully committed to science. Among them, Mark Rogers, a geneticist and expert in the transmission of animal diseases. Rogers' research led to the development of the first ever test for the so-called mad cow disease, which has had a huge impact in preventing this disease from entering the human food chain. While Rogers would receive support from the Department of Agriculture for his work, Irish government attitude to science remained lukewarm. When I first came back to Ireland, the funding that the government was investing in science and the perception of science as an important aspect of society was, was very low. Uh, in, a, in a sense, artists perform for the public so they, that you see that. Scientists don't do that. They, you know, the, the concept of a scientist with his nose in a test tube at the, at the, isn't very imaginative or, or uh, in, evocative. So I suspect that it, it just got ignored, it just didn't have a priority. I mean, we, we've got to remember the island of the 70s and 80s were effectively bankrupt, so we couldn't support science in, in, in that way. It wasn't a priority. I can certainly remember being involved in a, a process called technology foresight. Um, 
which I think a number of countries had done, but the, the whole idea behind it was to try and imagine Ireland in 20 years and see what was needed in order to make Ireland technologically and scientifically at the pinnacle of, of advancements in the world and, and to work back from where we wanted to be to see what we would need to put in place to achieve that. And, uh, well, the government bought into that whole process. And then suddenly, manufacturing jobs started to disappear to Asia in the late 90s. And the government realised there was only one game in town and that was innovation. And they realised very quickly that innovation and research were different uh, sides of the same coin. Gradually, Ireland's understanding of the importance of science was changing. And finally, in the year 2000, the Irish government made an important commitment to scientific research with the establishment of a landmark new agency. And then they set up this thing called Science Foundation Ireland, which was definitely seen at the time and still is as fantastic, because compared to other countries in Europe then, the amount of money that was put up at that time was exceptional. So suddenly it went the other way around, from no investment to very significant investment compared to other European countries. Um, and that changed the whole landscape then, because suddenly we had mon enough money now. They have reinvigorated the Irish scientific scene through funding, such that now what we see instead of Irish scientists going abroad, we see foreign scientists coming to Ireland to do science. If you want to do good science and if you want to have a science and technology based economy, then you really need to have scientists that are doing research at the forefront that can teach the undergraduates and postgraduates in engineering and science that will go out and, and innovate. Irish innovation is now becoming commonplace across the globe. Alongside Irish scientists, Irish engineers are also making their mark, quite literally, on the international landscape. In Beijing, Rory McGowan from County Monaghan beat strong competition to win the contract for the new landmark headquarters of China Central Television. When it became clear we were going to win that project, um, the young partners from OMA, the architect, uh, came over to see me in London because they knew that it was the three of us who were going to make or break this project. You know, in three weeks' time, we we're going to put our name to a design that was without precedent uh, in a, a very unusual shape building with a, even under normal gravity situations serious challenges and then we were going to try and build it in a seismic zone so they asked me the question you know what you know how do you feel right now and i said is you know it's actually a mixture of 50 percent sheer terror and 50 percent sheer exhilaration we were presented with a, a form which you know threw everything out the window it was daring from the architectural point of view for many reasons but from engineering, it was without precedent. Well, did we really do this? <laughs> um, it's been fantastic being here, you know, from our office. We've got a fantastic view of the site, and I've been watching it for two and a half years go up. It's just an incredible opportunity and huge pride. You know, many of my colleagues are extremely jealous that I'm, that I'm here and can see it going up day by day. And every time we send off photographs around the world, everybody's going, wow. It was only really when I left Ireland that I became to appreciate the contribution we are making in, in science and engineering. And uh, so I think the, the story has been rewritten, but the Ireland story is, has been completely rewritten in the last 20 years while I've been away. That's quite clear. And uh, the, the story is, is much broader and, and much more exciting than we even imagined. <laughs> There's some great discoveries being made in Ireland. Uh, 
And the rate of discovery, if you like, if you're, very, if you're using a metric, I suppose if you could, has gone up a lot because of all this funding. So it was never a case that we weren't able to do it. It was just simply we didn't have the resources to do it. And I think that, that's going to be a feature on, ongoing. It's, it's just remarkable and encouraging to me uh, to go back to Ireland. Uh, um, I was in Cork last week uh, and go to meetings where the room is filled with bright young postdocs and graduate students and I might say from all over the world uh, and that's a sea change compared to 10 years ago. Nearly 70% of each rising year are going on to third level education and, and that's creeping up percent year by year so I don't know where that will level off, but the future essentially is of a generation of people living in this country who are almost all educated to third level standards, who therefore know the world, who travel well, who feel at home in the world, and, and probably most important of all, have, have a, a secure sense of identity built on nearly a century now of independence and, and at long last, success built on that independence.